Hi everyone, I'm Lindsay Hosfield and welcome to our Young Timers Ask the Expert series. Today we'll be talking to Dr. Randy Bateman from Washington University in St. Louis about topics surrounding research participation, including clinical trial participation in the early onset familial Alzheimer's disease community, which at Washington University, they refer to as the dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease population. Dr. Bateman is the Charles F. and Joanne Knight Distinguished Professor of Neurology, Director of the Dominantly Inherited Alzheimer's Network, Diane, and Director of the Diane Trials Unit. Dr. Bateman's research focuses on understanding the causes and sequence of, of events that occur during Alzheimer's disease, particularly in the dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease population. That is in hopes to develop improved diagnostics and treatments for Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Bateman, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, good morning, Lindsay. It's, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me. We're so happy to have you. So before we begin, I just want to talk um, to people about what they can ex expect from our conversation today. Um, it's overwhelming to find out that your family or your parent has or is at risk for this disease, um, that even that's an understatement. And then trying to navigate and find the best care and treatments for your loved one. It's, it's a lot. And I want to, I want to recognize that, but joining a clinical trial, you know, your own research participation, you know, you're forced to face this disease, confront this disease, not only on a physical level, but an emotional level as well, which can be difficult. And so my hope is that this video can help those who are trying to navigate that difficult situation. Um, we've included some basic questions and some questions that dive a little bit deeper because we know that there's a wide range of experiences and knowledge within our community. And so I hope that, that this video helps address some of those questions and concerns. Um, my other hope is that we can help everyone better understand what this disease is and how it fits into the greater Alzheimer's disease world. So with that, um, I'd like to begin our questions. So Dr. Bateman, just to kind of lay the foundation for everybody uh, listening, can you explain the key similarities and differences between dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease and the more common late onset or sporadic Alzheimer's disease? Yes, and, and I'll start just by describing what is Alzheimer's disease. And so in Alzheimer's disease, we in the medical field, we define that as a, it's a neurodegenerative disease that causes a dementia. Dementia is a term that we use to describe when there's significant cognitive and thinking impairment that causes impact on that person's daily life. And Alzheimer's disease is specifically defined by a dementia that is caused from two kinds of pathologies in the brain. One is an amyloid plaque, which deposits in the brain. And these are tiny microscopic structures that are scattered throughout the brain in Alzheimer's disease. And the other is a tau tangle or a tangle pathology. And these are actually inside neurons clumped together proteins from proteins that normally exist, but they become misfolded and they begin to stick together and aggregate in the brain and they cause damage to neurons. Those Which is two why it's called neurodegenerative disease, right? Because you have the degeneration or the loss of neurons, right? That's exactly right. And we think that that's the final common pathway. So when the neurons degenerate, when they get sick, when they die, uh, those neurons can no longer help the brain do its job of thinking and understanding language and memory and uh, um, planning and doing all the things that we, we take for advantage in our daily lives. So that neurodegeneration is the kind of the end part of this process. And we've learned a lot about Alzheimer's disease in general. And uh, I think it's a, a little helpful to, to take a history here of all, a very brief history of Alzheimer's disease, since it was described in modern times by Dr. Alzheimer in 1906. It's gone through a lot of changes of understanding. And, and one of the more recent changes has been in the nine, 1950s to 1970s, the realization that Alzheimer's was not a rare disease in early onset people as was previously thought, but actually is a common disease that affects many people as we get older. It used to be called senility and then hardening of the arteries and, and other terms, but actually the plaques and tangles that build up and cause Alzheimer's disease as we know it, what we call late onset or sporadic Alzheimer's disease, 
is very, very common. And over the age of 85, upwards of 40 to 50% people will have Alzheimer's disease in their brains. And so that common form since the 1970s has been well recognized as a, as a major uh, cause of disability and death in older people. As we get older, the risk goes up substantially. And then there was a, there's been a focus on families that have Alzheimer's disease in their families that really uh, got intense interest in the 1980s and 90s because um, the possible understanding of what causes Alzheimer's. And what was discovered in the early 1990s was that mutations in, in one of three genes causes a form of Alzheimer's disease that has a variety of names. It has been called familial Alzheimer's disease. It's been called genetic early onset Alzheimer's disease or familial early onset Alzheimer's disease. It's also been called autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease or dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease. And these are all synonymous for the same uh, disease, which is a mutation in one of these three genes is inherited in a family. And if a person gets a, one of those mutations, they're all but guaranteed that they will get Alzheimer's disease. And what we've subsequently learned is that we can predict about when the disease will set in. And so that's the form of disease that many of us have specialized in studying because it holds many keys to understanding, uh, detecting and identifying, and, and someday we believe treating and preventing the disease. And so this dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease is similar in many respects to the late onset sporadic form of disease, but it has some notable differences. So I'll start with the differences. Mm -hmm. One major difference is that in, in dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease, that form of the disease uh, is caused by a mutation in one of those three genes. Whereas sporadic Alzheimer's disease uh, or which is mo the vast majority of late onset Alzheimer's disease, um, we don't know what causes the disease in those individuals. Unlike the mutation, it's a one for one match. If you have the mutation, you get the disease. And the late onset sporadic forms, we still don't know precisely what is the cause of the disease. The second major difference is that in most of the families that we work with, their onset of Alzheimer's disease is much younger than the late onset sporadic form. Now there's some overlap here between the two. The, the younger onset folks, the average age of onset in those families is about 45 years old. For some people it's 55 or 50 and for others it can be 40 or 35, even as young as 30 or less. Mm -hmm. And so there's they're very early onset people with the familial dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease compared to the late onset Alzheimer's disease and sporadic where the average age of onset is around 75, right? And it goes mm -hmm. up, you know, some people at 65, but there is some overlap. So there are early onset cases, for example, that have, er, that have younger onset of 60, 55, 50, that are not caused by mutation. So they would mm -hmm. not be counted as dominantly inherited. So Interesting. We, see, we see this as a continuum between age and cause. Now, all the other parts of the disease though are quite similar, the plaques and the tangles, uh, are very similar between the two diseases. The uh, clinical manifestation of memory loss and progressive cognitive difficulties that lead to dementia are similar. Even the duration of the disease is similar. We think there are some subtle differences. For example, we think that um, uh, it's an open question right now whether the early onset cases have a more, more aggressive or faster decline than the late onset cases. Uh, we think there may be even more pathology, more plaques, more tangles in the dominantly inherited cases compared to the late onset sporadic cases. Mm -hmm. But these are shades of gray. These are not, they're, they're, it's, they both have plaques, they both have tangles. And so, um, so I think the big message is it's really age and, and the familial nature of inheriting the disease that, that is the biggest difference. But otherwise, the diseases are largely similar when we look at them at the, with the various biomarkers. I think that's a good lead up into our next question. I mean, as you, you spoke about, given the hereditary nature of dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease and thus the predictability of the disease and disease outset, um, what role has this disease community played in our understanding and 
development of therapies for the general population at risk for late onset Alzheimer's disease? Um, it's played what I would what I would describe as an instrumental or seminal role in um, understanding the disease and developing treatments and therapies for Alzheimer's. And let me try to give some background to, to that statement. Um, the hereditary nature, the power of what can be understood by knowing ahead of time who's at risk, who's going to get the disease due to a mutation. And the information that those mutations have provided the field of Alzheimer's disease research uh, can't be overstated. It's enormous. Um, the, let me give some, uh, some history here. So in the early 1990s, I mentioned that mutations were discovered in families that, were, uh, that have this dominantly inherited form of Alzheimer's. Uh, and they demonstrated, as I said, that those mutations cause the disease. From that molecular understanding that that single genetic mutation in the DNA code came what I would describe as a molecular biology revolution in the field of Alzheimer's research. Those mutations were then taken and put into uh, uh, models and cells in the dish for animals and, and different things to understand how does Alzheimer's progress? How does it start? How does it form? How does it um, progress into the dementia that we were trying to study? Um, and that opened up the possibility that once you understood how Alzheimer's could start and grow and be established, um, now what you could do is you could ask the question of what ways do we have to stop it or to detect it? And so in the lab, what was done uh, in a variety of labs around the world, these mutations have been the, the power force of figuring out how to stop Alzheimer's. And it was from those mutations that the first specific treatments that target the pathology of Alzheimer's disease were developed. So for example, labs did research and they figured out that they could immunize, just as today we're being immunized for COVID-19, they could immunize against um, the amyloid beta proteins that the mutations increase longer, stickier forms of and protect the mice with these mutations from getting that pathology. And they could then use the antibodies made from those immunizations to protect against it. And, and all of the, the current uh, treatments now in clinical trials that we hear about, these monoclonal antibodies, gantt and aducanumab and van 2401 and all of them, They've essentially all been developed from these initial findings of how to counteract the amyloid plaques using those mutations. And so that's, a, that's one example of, of how powerful the discoveries have been. Since then, um, the families have contributed in, in center studies and in the worldwide studies now, Diane and Diane too, um, to understand how the disease not just starts and, and what are effective ways to, to treat it there, but how does it progress? What, you know, in what time period does it progress over? And so one of the big findings uh, that we had early on in the Diane study was that families that have these mutations, that their process starts 15, 20 years before the very first symptoms. And that was really the first data in the field that confirmed for us that this is a long process. It builds up over time before people even begin having any forgetfulness. And the last 10 years of the disease, that symptomatic phase, once people begin to forget and it progresses with cognitive and clinical symptoms, but that's the last third of the disease probably, the process. And so this gave strong rationale for things like prevention trials. Can we go in and treat people before they have memory loss and before they have cognitive difficulties? And is there a way that, um, that we can stop that process before it causes major problems. And so the, the understanding that's been obtained, not just from the description of, of the different mutations, um, but especially the contributions of research volunteers, people who go in and volunteer in studies and contribute their cognitive and clinical tests, the, all the imaging that's done, the collection of the biofluids, the blood and the cerebrospinal fluid, these things have been really core to the understanding over the past 10 to 15 years um, 
of how Alzheimer's progresses and, and what changes. And, and one of the latest chapters in this, the second chapter, I'd say, you know, talked about the plaques and the tangles. Well, I've talked about the plaques, but the tangles now are, are high, high focus in the therapeutic field. And we're now learning lots about how these tangles form and what changes with tau in the fluids and in the scans. And so the whole time, I, I would say the world of researchers, Alzheimer's researchers are looking to the families and their contributions to understand the disease and to figure out, you know, how we can best try to treat it. Yeah, it's, it's really quite striking. I mean, as, as a researcher myself, you know, I am working with mice that develop Alzheimer's disease because we gave them and we introduced an early onset, a dominantly inherited mutation. And the, the power of that to, to do, you know, to study the amyloid plaques, to study the tau, to study other brain cells, you know, to figure out if a drug works. I mean, that is unbelievably powerful. And, you know, I think it, it's, it's worth mentioning. I mean, if you tried to do these trials in late onset Alzheimer's disease, it would almost be too late because as you talked about, when symptoms are there, the neurons are kind of already gone or lost. And to come back from that is going to be really difficult versus treating much, much earlier before any of that damage happens. So, yeah. Hey, well, just to comment on that, you know, the, the, what is it, the Ben Franklin saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cures. Uh, we use that all the time in medicine, even though I think he used it in some other context originally, but, um, but it's very true. I mean, uh, trying to prevent diseases is much, much better in medicine than, than trying to treat them after they've really set in. Yeah. Um, I'd throw something else out there for the listeners that, um, you know, if, if that hadn't happened, if the families hadn't been doing research and hadn't contributed their time and effort and the mutations weren't discovered, um, sometimes I wonder like, what would, where would we be today? And I don't, I'm pretty sure we wouldn't be here in terms of having the potential. So for example, for the first time in probably ever, thousands, millions of years, we've been able to reverse Alzheimer's pathology. We've been able to lower plaques and remove plaques out of the brain. We don't ever see that if, unless you're treated with one of these drugs. I don't think those drugs would have been developed without the mutations being discovered and utilized. And so we would, we would be in a very different world yeah. uh, if families hadn't contributed and uh, provided those mutations. I, I just don't see any other way to do it. It'd be really hard to develop that without some kind of model that you could do because to do that in people is just it's a it's an insurmountable task without knowing ahead of time how to do it especially in the brain it's a really especially difficult in the brain. <laughs> especially in the brain our yeah. brains are well protected that's a good yeah. thing yeah uh, but they're also well protected from lots of things we're trying to do with it which is the harder thing yeah i've heard other participants say you know, that our greatest weakness is actually our greatest strength, which exactly, you know, hits it on the nail, what you just said. So, so my next question, it, it kind of talks about, you know, you're, you're following the stages and the progression of the disease. So, so speaking to more about that, one of the major challenges that clinicians face is developing effective tools to diagnose Alzheimer's disease, you know, without a mutation, of course, it's really hard for those late onset cases to know where the disease is and what's happening. And so clinical trials in the dominantly inherited population have focused on this question as well as understanding the stages and progression of disease. We hear a lot about how the development of effective biomarkers will help us answer these critical questions. So I have kind of three questions. You know, what are biomarkers? How are they used in clinical trials? And can you give us some examples? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's a, it's a golden age for biomarkers. So, um, and I'm gonna provide a very brief history here as well. So uh, I was taught in medical school and residency that the only way to diagnose Alzheimer's disease was after someone had died. You could look at their brain under an autopsy and then you could diagnose Alzheimer's. But without that, or a brain biopsy, you could not diagnose Alzheimer's disease when people were alive. So that's completely different now. And, and by the way, my residency wasn't that long ago. So, um, so over 15 years, um, this has completely changed. 
And some of the first discoveries were in cerebrospinal fluid from the spinal taps that people do. Um, the proteins that change there, the amyloid beta protein that makes up the plaques and the tau protein uh, that comes from the, the main tau protein that, that is associated with tau tangles. Those two proteins can be measured in cerebrospinal fluid. And we knew in the mid 1990s that that could be used to potentially identify people with Alzheimer's disease. It took a good decade of research to really prove that and get assays validated and demonstrate that that worked well. Um, but, uh, but that really was one of the first highly accurate uh, biomarkers. And then in the mid 2000s, uh, the PET scans uh, started coming. And the first was the amyloid PET scan. And that was uh, originally PID-PET with Bill Kwong and Chet Mathis. They developed these, uh, a tracer that you could put in the blood. It would go throughout the whole body, including the brain, it would bind to plaques specifically, and then would it stay, in, stay with the plaques. And then you could detect that tracer in the brain. And that's what we call a PET scan. And so the amyloid plaque PET scans were a huge advancement in our field. Because now not only could we detect whether the person had plaques or not, we could see where they were. We could measure how much was there and what regions of the brain they were in. And then in follow-up to that, uh, we had tau PET scans developed. So now we could track the tau pathology, the tau tangles, and again, see where they're at in the brain and how much is there. So this happened uh, uh, just in this past decade. Um, and was a major advancement. And then in 2017, people had been looking for many decades in blood for biomarkers and lots of suggestive things or associated things, but not something highly specific enough that you'd use for an individual person to say, you have Alzheimer's, you don't have Alzheimer's. Uh, but what we've discovered was that um, there are highly specific biomarkers in blood, just as there are in cerebrospinal fluid, and you can use measures of those to actually identify uh, who likely has uh, the pathology of Alzheimer's disease, amyloid plaques. And, um, and we're working on uh, measures in the blood to think about um, tangles as well. And so th this is a, an explosion of biomarkers, of measures of Alzheimer's, where we can do this when people are alive. We can do this now easily with sim simple blood samples, and we can do this over time. So we can measure how it changes over time. And, and that really wasn't feasible or, or possible before these biomarkers were developed. And so um, it's it really important for these uh, biomarkers uh, for diagnosis in the clinic for people uh, who are at risk of Alzheimer's disease or we think might have it. But the real power here, the thing that many of us are looking to is the predictive power. And so we talked about how the families with the mutations are so unique and special and that we can predict at any point in their life if they're gonna get Alzheimer's and about when they'll get it within a few years. Um, with these biomarkers, one day we might be able to do this for a lot of people, for most people. And, and so the question will be, how good can the biomarkers get? How can we use them to make predictions? And is this a bridge between the the early onset dominantly inherited forms of the disease and the late onset sporadic form where things that we develop for the early onset families, now we can implement in a much larger population for the late onset sporadic uh, populations. So we're hopeful that these biomarkers will be useful in that way, that we'll be able to implement them in straightforward ways and, and be able to offer them to larger populations. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to note too that some of these biomarkers are available, you know, for, to primary care physicians, you know, who want to, to diagnose Alzheimer's disease, but a lot of them aren't and a lot of them are still really in development and it's hard, I think, to make interpretations because you hear a lot in this community people maybe want to get an amyloid PET scan or they want to get a tau to know how far along they are in their disease, let's say they already found out that they have a mutation. And I think we're still a few years off from really, you know, being able to tell, well, what does it actually mean to have this biomarker? I think, you know, you guys are, are getting us to that, to that point, but I, I think there's still a ways to go. Would you, would you agree with that? Yes, I completely agree with that. And, and just, to, just to address that point, Lindsay, the, um, the, the biomarkers, what we've been talking about this whole time has been research. 
right? Right. And, and so that's not publicly available to the right. general community, the doctors and patients and, and people like that. In fact, uh, there was just recently a CLIA approved blood test that was made available to doctors. Um, and, and that's the first test. And so there's a lot more that needs to be done with that. And there's a lot in the medical setting that has to be done with that. Um, the PET scans are approved uh, for use by doctors. And so they can be done. The CSF test can be done. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned the first blood test is out. So, um, so these things can be done in the clinic. Um, the, the issues of whether they're covered by insurance and, and how they're used and things like that, that's a, that's a whole different topic. Right. Um, but, but, the, but what I would tell people is that, look, the research is on the fast track and they're coming. And so I, I think it's a matter of time before they are brought into mainstream practice where people can use them. Um, the thing that'll really transform that, in my opinion, is going to be when we have highly effective treatments or treatments that require us to know for certain, is it Alzheimer's? And in the clinic today, actually it's, it's pretty important for us to know whether it's Alzheimer's because we do prescribe medications and we, we, uh, there are other things to look for besides Alzheimer's if it's not. So I think that there's utility now, but I also think that it's gonna change a lot when new treatments uh, come out. Okay, our last question. Speaking of biomarkers, um, is it true that you were one of your first test subjects in analyzing amyloid CSF levels? No. <laughs> right. So, um, so that is true, uh, and wow. I'm wondering about your source now. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, um, so I'll, I'll give the brief history. So, first of all, there's a there's a long history in medicine of self experimentation. And, um, uh, and under the right conditions and circumstances, I personally think it's a very good idea. Who knows more about the research and the, the pros and cons, the relative risk and benefits than the person who's designing the research? Um, I also personally think uh, as a physician, uh, someone who treats patients and as a scientist, that it's important for us to, for us being physician scientists, to really understand what it is that we're asking other people to do. And so one of the things that uh, I believe is that we should all test the things that we're asking others to participate in the studies with us for. So we should try these things. Um, and also at the time, there was a big unknown question whether we could, we could actually do the, uh, whether the experiment would work, whether we could label amyloid beta and detect it in cerebrospinal fluid. So, um, so yeah, so we designed this experiment and um, I, I wrote my own consent form. I read it, I understood it, signed it and um, uh, did the study. Uh, I did not do my own spinal tap. David Holtzman That's did good. the spinal tap. So, uh, and, and, but I did analyze the sample as soon as the, the study was uh, completed. I, I ran up and analyzed the, the sample with eager excitement and saw some of the first label day beta. So it was a really special time for me. And, uh, and I, I look back on it with fondness, but yeah, others have, in other fields have done this. And I think in our field, uh, we continue to, to do this. So I think it's, overall, I highly recommend it for the physician scientists out there listening. <laughs> well, I think it's just a testament to your, your true dedication to this disease in this community, you know, and, you know, as somebody who's had a lumbar puncture, it's good you know, to know that the people who are asking us to do this know what that involves. Um, so I really, I appreciate all you've done for this disease. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. I know you're a very busy, busy person. And um, yeah, just, just thank you so, so much. And um, we'll pick up again um, with the rest of our questions um, in our next second half of this series. Okay. All right, thank you, Lindsay.